and we're seeking you. So, Father, today your word says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And we just pray right now for a proceeding word, something, Lord, that will meet us right where we are. So give us ears to hear it, eyes to perceive it, Lord, a heart to receive it, we ask. And we just thank you again for this time and your presence. Lord, let, let Lord, everything else... Lord, we put behind us right now. We just come into the threshold of faith. We step over that threshold and we say, Lord, here we are. And have your way today. Lord, I, I thank you, Lord, for your hand to help us in that endeavor. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And we're going to worship this morning.
say, Lord, right here, Father, let the King of Glory come in, Father. Not just singing, but Lord, our hearts in your presence. So we press in, Lord. Open up the gates today of our heart. Open up the gates of our thoughts today, we pray, that you may come in and have your way. Amen. Are you past the point in the weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that I can feel it?
moves, how he raises the dead, how he saves the thousands, how he loves those that seem to be unlovable. Well, I say unto you, my people, he's the same God that you serve today. The God of grace, the God of mercy. He serves, he serves you. He, he gives you the grace, the love, and the mercy. For he sent his only son to the cross to pay the price of what man has fallen from. And I say unto you today, to receive him by faith, to walk in the faith, to be with the God, the God that you read about, that you serve, the God that did the miracles in the word, is the same God that moves today. He's the only true God, the God of power and love, and he sees everything that man does upon this earth, says the Lord. Father, thank you for your encouragement today, Lord. Your word that, again, comes forth among your people to speak life and hope, as it says in 1 Corinthians 14, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we're a Bible-believing church that believes you speak today. Lord, we believe that, Lord, you communicate your heart today, and you have, and we thank you for your affirmation about trusting in you, Lord, and you alone. So we look to you, Father, right now. We lift up our eyes for what's coming to our help. Our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And Lord, we look to you, Lord, the author and the finisher right now, Father. And whatever's going on, Lord, we just uh, put it in your hands. And we thank you in advance how you're going to work all things out for your good. We give you the praise for it.
recognize what he's done for us. Because there is no love without sacrifice. And when we talk about love, there has to be a level of sacrifice. So when God talks about love, he talks about sacrifice. He talks about God's ability to, again, persevere with us through some of the hard times of our lives. So we serve open communion, which means if you've accepted the Lord, you can take communion in this place today. Because God loves everyone. And when they call upon the Lord, the Lord says you have a relationship with him. But it's a practice that says, I believe. It's a moment that says, either you believe or you don't believe. Well, this is an opportunity to say, I believe. I believe in the fact of what God's done for me, that he died for my sins, that he uh, was resurrected on the third day, that he's the power that changes from the inside out. And today we were going to celebrate that. We believe it's a meal that heals because by his stripes we are healed. Today we want to make that declaration over us today. It says on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took bread and he broke it and he, he gave thanks. What an odd time to give thanks when you realize that this was the night that you're going to be betrayed. I don't believe that Jesus knew it. It was going to happen. He knew who was going to do it. And yet, he broke bread with him. It reminds me of the scripture out of Psalm 23 that says, He prepares a table before my enemies. You know, um, that, that place again, of, he, he set a, a place at the table for a betrayer. That just seems kind of odd. But betrayal comes from a lot of different places in life. And sometimes we don't even realize that sometimes our closest people can be our worst betrayer. But the truth is that mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And so today when we talk about that, that even in that place, God wants the best even for our enemies. What other kind of faith practices that we should pray for our enemies? It's crazy. It's hard to do. But God will help us to do that very thing. So I'm going to ask again to take a moment to take this bread. We're going to just take a contemplative moment. As I said, we're in the days of awe. And it's time to take inventory in your own personal life. And uh, say, Lord, am I right with you? Is there things in my life that I'm not happy with? Maybe there's some things that I've been convicted of that I'm not willing to give up. So today, Father, we take this bread. We just speak the power that's in the name of Jesus right now. The power that in your name is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, demons flee. It is that power that we have, Lord, that is not based on our religious condition, but upon our faith in Jesus, the name of all every name. It is not by works, Lord. It's not by some effort that we can take this communion. It's only by grace that we have been saved through faith and this not of ourselves. Lord, I thank you that right now I can't earn my way into heaven. I can live a thousand lifetimes and never make it because of my own personal goodness. But in my faith, I find hope and what I trust. And so today, Lord, we thank you that there is love because there's the greatest of all sacrifice. No greater love is anyone that he should lay down his life for his friends. And I thank you, Lord, that you call us friends, call us into relationship. So, Lord, we come right now before you and we break this small wafer and we say blessed be the Lord the Lord gives the Lord takes away blessed be his name forever today Lord we thank you for the power that by your stripes I am healed it's out of brokenness that goodness Lord oftentimes comes it's out of Lord death that we find the greatest hope of the resurrection and the power and through your death today Lord we celebrate your mercy and we come, Lord, and humble ourselves in your mighty hand. Lord, as we practice this, Lord, we do this in remembrance of what you have done for us that we could never do for ourselves. Lord, today we thank you for this prayer. Let's take it together. It's a following the dinner that they shared together, the Passover dinner. This is a different cup. There's really three cups that they take during the Seder, and this cup was representative of, of the Elijah cup, the last cup. And so today, we're going to be speaking on Elijah. We speak of hope, but I thank you for the power of what this represents, that nothing but the blood of Jesus can wash away my sins. Lord, it is in this hope today, Father, that the power that's in your name will wash, Lord, away the filthy stains. Things that, Lord, would be normally a reminder, but 
But Lord, as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our sin from us. Lord, your word says you put it into a sea of forgetfulness, there to be remembered no more. Because of its power to forgive and to restore, the power to change us from the inside out. Today, Lord, we thank you for this cup. And Lord, again, it's a cup of covenant. It's a blood covenant that we have between you and the Father. And so today, Lord, we thank you for, Lord, that covenant to be yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Let's take the cup together. Father, today, we just thank you that mercy is triumphing right now. But we just want to let go of things that have been said to us, things that, Lord, have harmed us. And through the power, Lord, of the blood of Jesus, break its grip, loose its grasp. But we pray right now in the authority of your mercy, Lord, that those, Father, that have been our enemies, we pray for them today. We pray, Father, that you give them right, that you'll help them. Lord, truly help them, Father. Lord, to again, turn things around for good. That which seems to be evil. Lord, even the things that they have done, Lord, you have an amazing way of turning things around. And so, Lord, we thank you in advance to do that very thing. Lord, I'm praying for those that are struggling with, Lord, some area of their life today, whether it's financial, physical, Lord, mental health. Lord, I pray Lord, right now as we put our life in your hand, we're asking for your help. We just call things into divine order in our family. Lord, every crooked place straight, every rough place smooth, every, Lord, depressed, difficult, hard, God. Just pray, I just hear that hardness, oh Lord, and, and the difficulties and challenges that, Lord, people are facing every day. But, Lord, we put our hope in you and our trust in you. And right now, Father, we, we ask for strength. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And today, Father, we just pray for a renewing of strength on the inside, strength mentally, strength, Lord, in our heart. Lord, I pray, give us a heart to be able to persevere, to stand up and persevere, Lord God, we pray. We just thank you, Father, for your hope. It's in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, our, our administrator, uh, Lydia Ward, to share. The elder, Lord, let's go. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. It's truly been a good morning. Yeah. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming today. I want to thank you, all of you on Facebook and Pastor Brian Sadella. I see you. Happy birthday, baby. <laughs> Happy birthday. So, he was 40. Right? Just 40. Just 40. <laughs> now I'm speaking from 64, just 40. Okay, so let's go forward. So let's take care of the Lord's business. Let's stand as we prepare our hearts and minds to give back to Him who has given so much to us, right? Okay, so. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 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 And for those of you not here, you can also give on our slide notes. Um, we have a flock on website link. You can also give on our website. And of course, mail works. You can mail it in. <laughs> okay. So let's get started. I, you know, I just want to thank Pastor for mentioning about Rosh Hashanah. I've been reading their prayers. They're so heartfelt. Mm -hmm. So let's go forward. We had an interesting day yesterday, and I thank God for the turnout. Mm -hmm. I thank God for the East Lake women's group who came and, and volunteered with us. I thank God for Thrifty on the Vine and all the people who work in Thrifty who worked so hard yesterday so that that would be successful. We thank God for John Denham from Hands That Serve Ministry as he put his hand to the plow to help us. Yeah, and Lord, thank you for the vendors who had a heart to come out and sell their wares. I believe it was successful in my eyes. Mm -hmm. So we're praying that we'll have another one. I don't know when, but soon. With that being said, we thank Mike Chesney as well. We thank him for his work. We thank you for the raffle he gave, that, that beautiful picture. 
And I want to announce to you that Vicki Kovac is the winner of the raffle. So congratulations, Vicki. Contact Mike to get your picture. <laughs> okay, so with that, seems, with that being said, we have a couple of events this week. Um, I want to keep you informed about our pie fundraiser. The pies cost $20. They're 10 inch pies, they're garden pies. Information can be found out in the fellowship hall. Also, if you'd like to sign up, we have a sign up sheet out there as well. And you can see this beautiful woman here, Pastor Murray's Randall Walker, with this beautiful top on. She'll be the one you talk to about the pies, not Sister Lisa. Okay. <laughs> I do, I will talk to you about it. I'm just kidding. I'm available to talk to you about the pies. Okay. Um, this week's schedule Monday, Bible study, 5 30. Brother Charlie winds in it. How you doing? And then Tuesday, we're having, um, we have a food distribution from 4 to 5, and then from 5 to 6, Connection Meal Church. We'll have a meal with a message, and that's from 5 to 6. Okay. And then um, Wednesday, we will have a um, Bible study. We have prayer, compassionate prayer from 11 to 12. If you have media prayer, call me, contact me, Facebook, church, and I will pray. We will pray for you. Okay. And then with that being said, this Tuesday, no, I got the date wrong. This Tuesday, um, September the 19th, we're having a $2 off your total price, $2 off your transaction at the thrift store. So it's actually this Tuesday, it starts. Okay, now this week is our busy week. So on Friday, we need your assistance with helping with the bagging of produce that we give to the hungry. That starts at nine o'clock on Friday. Anyone is welcome to come. Then on Saturday, we actually give out the produce and that starts at eight. So if you'd like to come and put your hand to the plow, I'd be glad to see you. Pastor would be glad to see you, <laughs> seriously. So we have free pet food at that same time. So with that being said, I wanted to announce that the Church House of Living Stones is having a two-day marriage conference. It's on December the 1st. On December the 1st, it's for marriage couple only. They're going to do a formal event. And I'm going to give you more information as time go on. On December the 2nd, it's for singles. You may attend. Pastor Brian Sandella and First Lady Bonita is so excited about this, and they're hoping that you would partake in this. And I'll be sending stuff out in our weekly bulletin. So Brian, I got it again. Okay. Now, I want you to know, too, we got another event coming up real soon, and that's on October the 7th. That's on the Saturday. We are having a worship night. Gary Sanders Jr. will be here. For, will be here. He's, in, he's involved with the Inhabit Worship Band, and it's going to be at 6 p.m. There's a flyer out in the hall, and you'll see it on our weekly bulletin. We're all excited. And Vicki Kovac, on October the 14th, she's doing an emergency prepping class. That's at 6.30 p.m. She's really doing a lot of work to make that successful. So I pray that you can come and attend. And as the week goes on, because this is our season to be busy, continue to watch our Facebook page. Also, um, if you leave me your email or your email or text address, I will keep you informed of upcoming events. God loves you and I love you too. Amen. 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 Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, just want to thank all the guys that helped us too at uh, the produce distribution at the East Lake Senior Center. Uh, we did, I think, uh, five tons of produce that we gave out 265 families, the largest we've ever done uh, in any endeavor. So it has been an awesome season as far as opportunity. And this Saturday, uh, we really could use some help just to guide traffic. So if you're an early bird, we need your help because we have to hand out numbers as people come in the parking lot because. Uh, there's like five rows of cars lined up to go through the line and uh, it has been uh, just amazingly busy there so we give out free pet food as well so probably about 15 to 20 dollars worth of free pet food all the little dog treats and cat treats so you can both get dog and cat food and uh, probably about 20 25 dollars worth of produce so all of those things are about us providing resources to people within community because there is no love without sacrifice. We cannot say that we love our neighbor and do nothing. And I'm afraid there are too many Christians that have just said, hey, look, it's convenient. Uh, if you're looking for a convenient uh, church, you're gonna be uh, very uncomfortable here because we always talk about mission and some of the purposes that God has for us. And we, again, uh, believe that God has something for each of us and only God can really define that. No pastor can do that. But we just provide opportunities uh, for that to happen. And one of the things that happened yesterday 
uh, with our um, running sale. Our running sale is one of the most effective connection points that we have with people in the community because you can get a chance to talk to them. A lot of our resources and stuff, they come in, they go, there's transactions, that kind of stuff. But we, we believe in connections with people. Uh, it is not about resources or things that we uh, have here. It is about people. That's why Jesus didn't die for things. He didn't die for buildings. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? amen. He didn't die for a program. He died because he loves people. Amen. And so in that sense of if we're going to love people, we need that. You can't love them if, if you don't know them. And the first part of that is just taking an opportunity to spend time with them. That's what the connection meal is all about on Tuesday. You sit down with your neighbor, get a chance to talk to them. And, uh, you know, uh, it's amazing how that, that is a powerful way of encouraging life. So I want to get into the Word of God today. We're going to be uh, continuing a series of messages about Elijah. And uh, where is the spirit of Elijah? So today as we talk about Elijah, we're going to uh, relate it back to John the Baptist. As I shared last week, we were talking about Elijah and the forerunner spirit. And uh, Elijah uh, is a, a, a symbol, again, of the power of God. As some of you may remember his story is about him being raised, uh, again, by a fiery chariot. So he, he left this world like no one else. I mean, you're talking about, he got the, uh, God's uh, a limo to come down here, a fiery chariot, and uh, he got caught up, it says, in that fire and taken off to heaven. What a way to exit this world. I don't know if anybody's exited in a more dramatic fashion than Elijah. But Elijah, again, uh, came back. And someone said, well, how did that work, you know, that he came back? It wasn't the physical uh, side of it. He wasn't resurrected from the dead, but it said the spirit of Elijah would come. The last verse of the Old Testament in the book of Malachi, chapter 4, it, it describes what that role of Elijah was going to be. That he was going to turn the hearts of the father to the children and the children to the father. That was the role of John the Baptist. And so, or uh, that place of, again, bringing a message that brings people back to God. You ever have a conversation with somebody and you want them to come back to God? And uh, some things that come out of your mouth aren't always so kind. You want to, did I just say that? Oh, my goodness. Like, you know, you just told them the, the truth, and, uh, and you didn't even realize that you were ready to tell anything like that. That was not your intention. But sometimes your passion in the message is not always kind. And so that's, that's the Elijah of God within us. So we're going to look at seven similarities between Elijah of the Old Testament and John the Baptist of the New Testament. And we're going to come back to this place again of God calling us back, the message of getting back right with God. It's a message that our nation needs to hear. It's a message that the world needs to hear. And so they both deal with similar things. And so we're just going to jump into it here. Let's turn to 1 Kings 18.21. It's up on the, on the screen if you like, but if you've got your electronic device or your old school Bible device, you can use that as well. In 1 Kings 18.21, it says, and Elijah came to all the people and said, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him, not a word. Not a word. So this place again of, of that confrontation that takes place, the first thing that we want to share here is that both John the Baptist and Elijah preached repentance when Israel had turned from God. So John the Baptist in the New Testament, Elijah in the Old Testament, there was a message, get right with God. Now that message may not resonate with some people until you know you need God. Sometimes again, it happens to people that are ready to do that. Now, uh, some that, that message isn't very popular, you know. You know, uh, John the Baptist said, uh, repent, right, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let's, let's look at the message that he had in, in Matthew 3, 1 through 2. It says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what's crazy is that people went out into the wilderness to find John the Baptist and to get baptized. That's what he's known. That's why they call him the Baptist. Baptist means immersion. And one of our favorite bat baptism spots here, down by the, the dam on the Chagrin River, you know, uh, down there at, at Daniels Park, they just blew up the dam. Can you believe it? They removed it. 
It was only only that deep spot that we could actually have a water baptism. We we believe, again, to get baptized means to get immersed. And it says that we should get baptized in living water. So living water just means moving water. And so that's why we go into the river as often as we can. We've baptized, uh, again, between us and uh, the church house. I think we baptized about 35 people. Uh, and that's not including the 57 that they baptized up at Kanye uh, Lake Erie Correctional about a month ago. So they were only going to baptize 20, but 37 other guys are going to get baptized today. How do you like that? Uh, God's moving in the prison. So speaking of prisons, uh, we were at um, Indian Hills uh, last uh, Monday, which is the, the Juvenile Max prison here in Ohio. Uh, we got a chance to minister about 30 young men. And I still can't get their faces out of there. These gangbangers and other people that are in there. They, they have so many fights in the max prison that they, they shut it down. So it's been really hard for us to get in and see them. But I want you to pray for this ministry there. Uh, the director, her name is Beth. Uh, she, um, she goes there eight times a month into the juvenile prison. And they'll let her into four different pots. And in there, they'll, she'll, they'll bring pizza in just to have... A, a kind of normal aspect because many of the these young men that are there are not do not have a lot of close family it's broken you know some of them can't see their family by act of uh, of the law you know the judge said you can't you, there's a court order you have to be separated so it's wild let me tell you about a young man named chase chase uh, is one of the inmates there he couldn't even come out to the uh the stunt motorcycle show that that was there chase, chase 12 years old in a max Judy prison, right? How did you get there? Well, his father was an alcoholic, and his alcoholic father um, beat him. Beat him pretty good. So one day he was at school, and, and the teacher asked him, how, how did you get, the, get to this place? And, and uh, he said, well, you know, my, my dad and I got in a confrontation. You know, that's all they said. They didn't see the rest of the bruise. They just saw the one in his face. And so the teacher told the the uh, person in, in, at the school in charge of that talked to the superintendent, and they, they decided to call the father. Well, that was the wrong thing to do, because that father laid a whooping on that young man that he did not forget. He was so angry, so hurting afterwards, his father passed off from the alcohol that he had, and this young man, Chase, 11 years old at the time, took a baseball bat to his father and hurt him back. He ended up, again, arrested, taken to jail in handcuffs. Imagine, 12 years old. We, friends, live in a messed up world. And the people that get hurt and injured along the way is so sad. Because there's some things that money can't change. Counselors can't, again, even identify because that's real, friends. And I'm afraid that too many people want to talk about the nicety of what church is about. But the real thing is that we're on a mission from God. And if we don't get about our business, there's going to be a lot more chases in jail. Because somebody didn't stand up and say, you know, that's not right. we got to make a difference before it's too late. Alcohol, drugs have broken way too many families in our community. And every one of us has been touched in some way or another from that tragedy that it is. We have people that we've worked with. We have people that we know. Yesterday, I, I saw a young, young girl, seven years old, Des. When she was three months old, her father died of an overdose. The third time that he had an overdose in one week, and the third time he did not make it. The Narcan didn't help. Friends, that's messed up. And the devil's a liar, and he's a thief, and that's why, again, if we don't stand up, who will? If you don't have a message, again, within you, who's going to do that very thing? So this place of what Elijah and both, again, John the Baptist had to say is not a convenient message, but it's a necessary message. Repent. It's time to change. And I'd say the word, best word for repent is make room for God in your life. There's too many people that have shut God out. There's no room for God in them. And so I, I just want to tell it plain today. That, again, that, that is a call of God on each and every one of us. And we have a responsibility to love our neighbors. And some of those neighbors need our prayers. And stop complaining about things and start praying about things. Too many people are saying, oh, this world's so messed up and it's this and that or it's politics or this is. It's not about flesh and blood things. It's about the spiritual battle that the enemies come to steal, to kill, and destroy. And he means business. And if you don't know that, go, go see a slideshow. You can, you can seek it out. A slideshow of all the people in a certain area that have died of heroin overdose. They are not 
strange people. They are not people that look like addicts. They are people that look like you and me. The average person, again, that dies of an overdose is, uh, is a 21-year-old female and a 24-year-old male who gets strung out in drugs. It is not somebody that's been on drugs a long time. There are some that have taken one hit, and that's the last hit they'll ever take. And that's scary. Does that scare you? It scares me. It's a message. So what's the response? The response is get right with God. That's what Elijah and Elisha had to say. And that was their message. The message that it says, again, in Malachi is there needs to be a turning away from, again, that which is broke families, the father to the children, the children to the father. That's a, that's a uh, again, nuclear family. And if you have not noticed, there is an all-out war on the nuclear family in America. There's an all-out war. There, in, in California, they just made a law that says that the parents don't need to know what their children are doing at a younger That's age. Crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. They can't even take an aspirin without parental permission, yeah. but they can make life-altering decisions in their life because they said that's their, their right as a child to make a life-altering decision. Well, our world is crazy. Sin is crazy. It's a level of insanity that needs the hope of God. Amen. Why do we need somebody? Who's going to be the messenger? That's, that's, why, that's why it says we, we need to be forerunners. There's some times where you, you say, what, what can I do? What can I do? You can do what God tells you to do. That's what you can do. And that may not be a little conversation with somebody. It may be, again, a prayer that you offer up to somebody in their family. Friends, that's real. Confrontation is not pretty. But both Elijah and Elisha were people that, that confronted. But it's the reason why they confronted. It wasn't that they just confronted because they were nasty people or mean, spirited. No, they, they had a passion inside of them that says, we want God's will more than our own. We want God's will more than our comfort. And again, all that is good is, that is necessary for evil to triumph is that good people do nothing. And so in this place of good people rising up and being the voice that God's called them to do, I mean, both Elijah came out of nowhere. We know again where, where John the Baptist came from, but Elijah was just, it said, a man like you and I were, and he knew how to pray. And in that sense, we need to be, again, certain that God has a plan and purpose. Let me go on to the second point, because I've got a lot to share today and a little time to do it. Their appearance was the same, mm -hmm. and it was offensive. They had an offensive appearance. And I'll, I'll show you what the scripture says by offensive appearance. They just didn't look like other people. It says in 2 Kings 1 7. It says, then he said to them, what kind of man was it who came up to meet you and told you these words? And so they answered him, a hairy man. Because <laughs> I am a hairy man. Okay, a hairy man wearing a leather belt around his waist, and he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. Because they knew that Elijah wasn't against somebody that was good looking. It says that he was kind of like the biker with, with the tattoos on, and you know, and his hair was all like crazy, and, and uh, he looked like somebody that you didn't want to meet in a dark alley. And in that place, Elijah the Tishbite was not was one of those kind of people. It says, What kind of man was it who came up to you? They were asking, and their description of him sounds a whole lot like Matthew chapter 3, verse 4, when it talks about John the Baptist. So now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Mm -hmm. Both of these descriptions talk about, you know, they, they were not dressing for success, as we would say that. I think there's a lot of churches that would kick those guys out when they walk in. They say, hey, you're not dressed appropriately, you need to go change. You know, you can't wear that in here kind of thing, you know, because they were probably sticking camel's hair. I'm just trying to I can't say, what kind of fashion statement was John the Baptist trying to make? I, I don't know. I'm just saying that he came as, again, there dressed in a certain way. Now, some people said he, he must have read the scriptures and found out what, John, what, what Elijah wore, so he decided to wear the same, same outfit. Maybe, maybe that's the case. But again, usually when you're trying to impress people, you do the opposite of trying to scare them, you know? <laughs> Maybe it was just, you know, repent, and the scary guy comes out, you know? That's what they said about Jonah and the whale. You know, after being in the whale for three days, the acid began to, you know, break his body down. So what happens when that takes place is you turn white. So they said when he was, you know, belched up onto the shore, he was like pure white. And so when he went into Nineveh and started to preach, this guy was like an albino, you know, walking in there and going, repent, 
And they're going, he's a ghost. <laughs> it's kind of freaky, so maybe that was God's plan. I don't know. I never really thought about the whole acid thing and, you know, his, his appearance. But, you know, man looks on the outward appearance. Yep. Yeah. But God looks on the heart. Amen. And we've got so many people today that are more concerned about outward appearances. Yes, they are. I mean, our building may be offensive to a lot of people, but to the needy who need food, it's not so offensive. Yeah. To the AA people that use our building five times, we have five meetings here every week. To those guys, they're not offended by our building. You know, it don't look like a church. You know, we got a cross in here. We actually had AA guys because we had the, the Roman cell because we had to bring all the AA guys in here and, and see that cross that says, for God so loves you. Amen. In that place, again, we're reminded that people aren't really that concerned about the outward appearance when it comes to their need. If they're broken, they don't care what you look like. John the Baptist and these guys were out in the wilderness, and it's, it's kind of an interesting thing, this place of dressing for success. I think today many more people are concerned about what's on the outside than what's on the inside. I mean, Jesus said that the Pharisees were whitewashed tombs. They, they had beautiful white on the outside, but the inside, man, they were dead. They were rotting inside. Boy, that's something that you can't tell for any person is what's going on on the inside. Only God knows really what's going on on the inside. And it's a message that, again, is transcended. Today, it says that their appearance was the same. Let's go on to the third one. Both survived in the wilderness. I'm a survivor. I love survivor shows. I don't know why. You know, I just love where people somehow survive, you know. So I, I love this show on the History Channel. It's called Alone. And uh, I love See, they're, they're starving themselves for like 40 days. They, they like eat like, like pigs before they go and then they can lose about 60 pounds of flesh, you know? And uh, it's like a, a starvation game. That, that's how they played it, you know? But it says that they went into the wilderness. You gotta have survivor skills, you know, when it comes to that. So it says that they survived out in the wilderness. So let's look at their survivor skills. They both had some God strategy. So the first one we'll look at is, is Elisha. And it says in 1 Kings 17, 2 through 3, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into uh, the Jordan. And then verse 4, it says, And it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded, and the ravens to feed you there. Now, remember, what, what Elijah prophesied to the king was that it's not going to rain for three and a half years. It's not going to rain. So he found a brook that, again, apparently was going to be open the longest. And so in that place, he decided that, you know, God, God directed him there. But the thing I don't get is fed by ravens. I mean, you know, I, ravens are kind of like nasty birds, like crows, but bigger, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just thinking to myself, you know, when you're hungry, it doesn't matter if it comes where it came from. If it came from a bird, I'll eat it. You know, when they're in the loam, when they're out in the wilderness, they'll they'll settle for a little mouse. They'll skin the mouse because they're so hungry they want to eat anything. It's just gross, you know? And yet, here's Elijah out in the wilderness, and his survival technique is God's going to send a bird. That's what he said. I'm going to send you a bird. It's better than Uber, you know, eats or whatever. I'm going to bring you this bird, and he's going to drop something down, and I want you to eat it. You know, well, number one is the bird thing in, in it being in its mouth is one thing, you know, but where's that, what, what kind of food is a bird going to get, right? So somehow God used that, and that was his survival skills. He had to trust God in the wilderness. So here's what it says about John the Baptist. We kind of read it already. It says, then, then the word of, in this place again, John the Baptist, we read it before in verse 4. It says that his food in the wilderness was locust and wild honey. Now, a lot of people think that locust means the actual insects, but that would have made, mean that John the Baptist was unclean because they were not allowed to eat insects. So it was really from a locust tree, the fruit of that, I believe. And I know there's a lot of commentaries, and I read a bunch as I was studying this, going, they're all thinking they got, you know, bug legs in their, you know, his beard. It's so disgusting, right? So, okay, scrub that image right now. <laughs> so let me just say this about a forerunner. And, and just related to us. God will bring provision in some really crazy ways. Mm -hmm. When we first bought this building, somebody donated, he worked for, he worked for a construction company. They were doing a rehab uh, on, a, a, on a Walmart up in uh, Lansing, Michigan. And so uh, they had all these huge uh, air conditioners. 
So the guy says, hey, will you take them? And, and so we, we found out you know, the challenge of what it would do to put that electricity and, and lift them up there. So we set them inside the parking lot. Well, one day when we came, they were gone. <laughs> like somebody still stole a ton and a half pounds of, of steel from our side lot. We're still trying to figure out how they did that, right? <clears throat> so we, we said, well, what are we gonna do? And one of our board members said, well, why don't we file a claim? You know, we, we hadn't paid anything for it. It was just sitting on the side there. And so uh, they said, okay. So the insurance agent comes back to us and says, well, yeah, we'll cover it, but you know, those things are pretty expensive. We said, so they, they came up with 16,000. Is that okay for you to take 16,000 for those things that were donated? And we said, sure, we'll take 16,000 for that. <laughs> it was such an odd way that, that, that took place that God provided in such an unusual way because the church was pretty lean on fun, funds and we weren't sure how to do anything at that particular point, but we knew that God would provide. So he may come in different ways to provide for you. You know, when, when God provides for me, just thank him. Don't get into the paralysis of analysis. Well, how does that work? Maybe if we go around the country and we get more uh, air conditioning units donated, we could actually fund the church. You know? <laughs> no, that wouldn't work with our insurance agent at all. You know? One and done, you know. One and I think we're gonna cancel you, Pastor. You know, um, in that place of God's provision, God works in mysterious ways. And provision is something that God is, it's his name. That on the mountain it would be provided. And that is in the context that God told uh, Abraham to go offer his son Isaac on the mountain. And so he took the wood, he brought his servants, you know, he was ready to offer up a sacrifice, his son as a sacrifice, and God said, I want you to go sacrifice your son. You know, and so this was the promise. He was a hundred years old, Abraham was waiting all his life for the promise of God. And God tells him to kill his son. So they go on a journey together, and he tells his servant that's with him, stay down here, we're going to go up to the mountain. And all this time, you know, he's thinking to himself. Now they say Isaac was probably 16 years old. Can you imagine him, 16-year-old? And you're trying to get him to go anywhere? Much less the wilderness? Much less on a mountain carrying wood and saying, what are we doing, Dad? Where are we going, Dad? What's going on? Then when he gets up to the mountain, he builds an altar. And then he ties his son, he lays his son on the altar. Where, where's the sacrifice, Dad? <laughs> on the mountain it will be provided. That's what God spoke to him. So Abraham looks over, and in the, in the bushes there's a ram that God had set, and I want you to sacrifice that instead. I mean, sometimes you get to the point where you think you know what's going on. It's in that moment that God will challenge you to say, do you trust me? Because it really comes down to it. It's the point of every relationship. Is it built on trust? Do you believe that they're going to come through? And, and Abraham said he was the father of faith. And he said, I believe. And so he went up the mountain ready to sacrifice his son. But God didn't have that in mind. He had something else in mind. And I believe that's true for each and every one of us today. That you think that God was trying to do this. He, that he's trying to end our family. He's trying to foreclose on my house. He's trying to give me my car that gets repoed. Because I don't know how God's going to meet it. But that's not God's plan. God has a plan within a plan. Within a plan, within a plan, within a plan. He's always 25 moves ahead of where I am, and I'm trying to catch up with the next move instead of the one that's again, takes me to that place where I, again, would, would be able to do that. I went to Brian uh, Sindel's birthday party yesterday. He's 40 years old. And I, it just reminded me how old I am. <laughs> 40 years ago, I graduated from North Central University. I became a youth pastor for about 10 years from there. And I'm thinking to myself, I didn't know anything then. I'm still not sure I know anything now. I just know that God's with me and I'm gonna trust him wherever he sends me, you know, that kind of thing. But along the path in your journey, sometimes it takes a, a great uh, opportunity for us is to kind of review what God has done. You know, remember where you came from. Remember all the little things that happened that you were able to survive. This is the plan that God had with Elijah and Elisha, is, or Elisha and John the Baptist. It's about that God provides a difficult place. So let me go on to the next one. Both are consecrated to the Lord. I believe anyone that comes to Jesus is a consecration that says, I'm gonna trust the Lord. And so we read that scripture earlier, you know, the, the, the challenge is, are you gonna serve the Lord or not? 
both were consecrated work. So let's look at the two passages of scripture here. It says in 2 Kings 1 16, uh, then he said to him, Thus says the Lord, because you have sent messengers and inquired of Beelzebub, the God of Ephraim, is it because there is no God in Israel to inquire of his word? Now this is John the uh, this is Elijah talking to Ahab the king. So he says, uh, you, you sent messengers to inquire of an idol, this Beelzebub, the god of Ekron. Is it because there's no god in Israel? And so here's what Elijah says, therefore you shall not come down from your bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. It is in that place that he came and he was consecrated to the Lord. You imagine taking him to the king in that particular place. He said, because there's no God in their life, people will turn to mediums. Because there's no God in their life, they'll look to other things. They'll, they'll throw dice to figure out what they're going to do. They'll, they'll kill a chicken and figure out you know, where the, the, the blood's going to lay when they splatter it on the ground. I mean, they had some really wild things to then. But friends, our culture has come back to the paganism of our past. And they put their trust in all kinds of foolish things. And when you hear it, you're going, you did what? You, you actually did that? And, and in this place, that's, that's kind of strange. Because there is no God in their life, they're going to make bad decisions. They're going to make decisions that will, again, honor, honor some other God or honor themselves rather than honor God. Because, you know, it's easier. This place, again, of the, the, the consecration. God's will, God will set you apart to do God's will. He just will. You're going to be different. You're, you're not going to be the same as everybody else. You're, you know, Jesus always calls peculiar people. And I am one of those peculiar people. You can hang out with me for a while. You'll find out. You'll be confirmation. Yeah, he is peculiar. <laughs> but that just means that I'm just not like everybody else. Because God didn't call me to be like everybody. And I said, if the Holy Spirit, I, I told you before, I'll tell you again. I, I, I was praying one day, and, and God said, how, I felt like the Lord spoke to me and said, how, how creative are you on a scale of 1 to 10? I said, maybe 6. You know, I'm pretty creative. And then, uh, then the Lord asked me, uh, I said, well, how creative is the Holy Spirit? And um, I said, well, he's very creative. You know, 100 million universes. You know, DNA, uh, there's a lot of things I don't even understand or comprehend in the world of physics and all of those kind of things. He's very creative. He says, so what about the Holy Spirit living in you and you, how creative will you be if you allow the Holy Spirit in one area of your life? Well, I said, I guess I could be pretty creative since he's in my life. And in that place, he says, why are you trying to be like everybody else? Well, I'm going to say that again. Why are you trying to be like everybody else? If God's the most creative power in the universe, and you think that somebody else is doing it better than you, and you're going to copy them, then why do you need the Holy Spirit? Why do you need the most creative power in the universe to come? Because in one moment, someone could be a billionaire, friend. One moment, one idea, one, one little thing could change everything in your life. In a moment. But yeah, we're relying on the creativity of all the other people in the world trying to do their thing. Wake up. God is a creative being. And so when we talk about this, this idea, are you going to trust God or others? I, I don't know. If God's a creator, which I believe, he's a creator of all the things that exist, then I think I'm going to go with the creator who can do that. He can fix out whatever problem I'm dealing with, no problem at all. All right, number five. Both preached against the behavior of an evil king. This is really kind of interesting. Ahab was a king that, again, uh, was, was basically a weak-kneed, inconsistent, man-pleasing, pussy-putting sissy. Yeah. Okay, so I just said that again, which is an acronym for whip. He was a whip. Weak-kneed, inconsistent, man-pleasing, pussy-putting sissy. Whips. Okay, I said that again. Just make sure that you understand it. Ahab was the archetype of those who say, it's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. Well, I can't do that. So he had to have a wife named Jezebel that kind of told him what to do. And that men need to have a backbone for God. Amen. 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 Okay. Not, not very strong amen from anybody else. All right. <laughs> First Kings 18, 18. It says this. And he answered, I have not troubled so Israel. So he has a conversation with Ahab. And here, 
here it says uh, that when he came on the scene, Ahab says, oh, he was looking for me. He finally found somebody, Obadiah, who, who went out to him. And Obadiah was afraid to say that he saw him. Because I know you, uh, Elijah, you're a slick kind of guy. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, I found him, I found him. And then the king's gonna go out and you're not gonna be there and I'm gonna be dead. And I'm a good guy. I've taken care of some of God's people and hide them from the king so they wouldn't get harmed. And you're gonna kill me because you're such a wily fellow. And Elijah told him, no, I'm, I'm actually gonna show up. So he did, so, you know. Obadiah went out and got the king, the king and him went out and they, they found Elisha. And so this, this statement here is what uh, he said. Uh, he says, oh, there you are, you trouble of Israel. So here's what Elisha says. And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. That particular place, again, is this king was oppressing him. I want you to know there's a lot of people who don't take responsibility today. Can I get a witness? Amen. A lot of people don't take responsibility. Because they will take time to say, it's your fault. It's you Christians. It's you who are a believer in God. And you're the pride. We just got rid of you. Life would be good. You're holding back the age of Aquarius, don't you know? And if we just got rid of the Christians, everything would be all right. That's what Ahab said. It's all going to be good if all the godly people just got out of the way so that evil would prevail. That's why sometimes they, you know, they, you wonder why some people don't like you? It's because you stand one iota with God. It like irritates them. Yes. We need a counter revolution in our world, there's no doubt. But it's scary because the intolerance of some people toward anything but Christians. You can't say anything about Buddha or Muhammad mm -hmm. or others, but if you take the name of Jesus, it's fine. But if you said something about Muhammad in the same way, hey, look, there's Muslims that attend our school, you know, they could get really upset. Yes. I mean, you don't have a problem with teachers just taking the name of Jesus by, in, in, in vain, or as someone said, God's last name is not damn it. But you would think that way it is because it comes out of the mouths of people who are influencers and leaders of our culture. Yeah, they have no problem saying that at all. They think you're in trouble. And if they could just walk on Jesus, spit on God, and that way things would be so much better if that happens. Well, let's see, we've tried that, and look at us now. Help us, Lord. So the next one, it says, here's what it's John the Baptist and his king said to him, for Herod had laid a hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother's brother Philip's wife. Because John had said, it is not lawful for you to have her. There was sin going on in the kingdom. And John the Baptist called it out. And so the king said, hey, we can't have you telling, telling those things to everybody else. Who are you to say what was wrong or not? Well, he was God's instrument. And so they laid a hold of him. That is the way that it is among, again, the life that we live. They'll say, say, it's not my fault, but you'll be blamed. And they'll think that they're justified. Have mercy on us all. The sixth thing that was in comparison is this. Both had their lives sought by wicked king, queens. Now Jezebel oftentimes is mentioned in the Bible. But Jezebel's a spirit. It is not male or female. Okay, I just want to say that. Oftentimes the manifestation here is that it's queens. Because there was use of that. In both their situations, is their end for the, the desire of Jezebel was to kill, again, uh, Elijah. So let's, let's look at the scripture. Uh, 1 Kings 19, 2. Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Now we're going to share a message next week on why Jezebel said that? Because there was 400 ministers of Baal that lost their life. Mm. And so because, you know, Elijah had just, again, won a great victory for Israel to say that God was who he said he was. And yet Jezebel said, no, no, we're not having that. You're going to die, Elijah. I don't care how many people you kill. You're going to die. And uh, Elijah freaked out. This place, again, of, of that spirit is, we call it, again, witchcraft. Let me just say how we say it. Whenever the, the darkness is there, he wants to dim the lights. Mm -hmm. Domination, intimidation, 
manipulation. So let me just say that again. You think that witchcraft is some kind of a, a, a potion or whatever that. Behind it is somebody wants to dominate you, wants to intimidate you, wants to manipulate you. And that's exactly what pharmacade is. It's a manipulation. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry basically works on getting your body to think differently about what has actually happened to you. So if you have pain, they try to say, no, they put in these blockers there in your system that they've researched, and they say, you're not in pain, but the truth is you still are in pain. Oh, yes. That, let's just make the spiritual application there. That, you know, the enemy comes in and says, oh, you, you think that, that uh, this is bad. It's not bad. It's good. You know, let me, let me just, I'm going to, again, say something here that uh, may have to be explained to you later. <laughs> but where the scripture says, when a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife, they become one. Mm -hmm. This is found in Genesis all the way through the book of Ephesians that describe this aspect that two should become one. But in Corinthians, it says that don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. And if you join yourself to a prostitute, mm -hmm. you become one with that prostitute. You know, let me ask this question. If you become one with this prostitute, and one with this prostitute, and one with this prostitute, what kind of person would you be? A pretty messed up, because you can't put one, one, one. No, is it one third, one third, one third? How much, again, of your soul can you divide in that place? Now, that, friends, is a spiritual reality that many people have that are very confusing. But I want you to know the good gospel news is that the power that's in the name of Jesus can bring wholeness to any person. Yeah. I, I remember with tears, young women that had lost themselves and having the conversation with them to say, I, I can't take that back. You cannot give back what God has said that, but God can make you whole. And sometimes that's better than the lady that were before because they weren't whole before. They hadn't given their life to Jesus. Now they've had some weapons put into their hands that they can fight the fight of faith. There are too many young people that are walking defenseless down the road of purity, not knowing that the devil is laying for them, Amen. not knowing that some devil is going to try to come in and steal that which God has given precious things to them. It's dangerous. It's perilous. And the good... The good gospel news is God's given you the ability to win through the power that's in his name. But whoa, it's a battle. And the devil doesn't play fair. Doesn't play fair at all. So the queen here. So he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come after you. That's what she told Elijah. Here's what uh, it was said again about John the Baptist. So she, having been prompted by her mother, said, give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Just to set that story up, right? So this daughter of Herodias the queen did a dance for the king, and the king made this outrageous offer. Whatever you ask up to half the kingdom, I will give it to you. And so they contemplated that. The mother was so angry at John the Baptist, she could have had any, she could have had gold, jewels, whatever. She decided, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get revenge on John the Baptist for publicly speaking against me, and I'm going to kill this guy, this troubler of Israel. That is what she said here. So again, she asked for it in the next verse 11. It says, and his head was brought on a platter, given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. What, what gross thing is that? Mm -hmm. That someone would, again, give that up. John the Baptist, Elijah were both, again, trying to be dominated, intimidated, manipulated by a queen. And again, John the Baptist his spirit is still alive today. He may be physically dead, just like Elijah is dead, but it's the spirit. Where is the spirit of God upon us today? We're going to do one more and we're going to quit. Both suffer from depression and doubt. I just want to say, sometimes people look at the, the people in the scriptures and they, they uh, put on their rose-colored glasses and they think, well, they were so much better than you or I. But again, we know, James said, that Elijah was a man just like you and I are, and he prayed that it would not rain and did not rain. This place, again, of him being human is pointed out, so people will point out to his the, the aspect that he did with depression or doubt. God's never been afraid of doubt. Christians are. 
Pastors are, because you know, who you doubt it all. You're gonna, not going to receive anything from the Lord. But when we come to what, what happened to, again, doubting Thomas, that he walked through the wall, and he let Thomas touch his hand without a rebuke. He didn't rebuke him. He showed him. So sometimes when our doubts and our fears are wondering, is this real? Ask God to show you whether it's real or not. So they both suffered from depression. Let's just go through it. We'll, we'll go on here. In 2 Kings 19.4, But he himself went a day's journey in the wilderness and came and sat down on a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. Now we're talking about Elisha. And said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. There's times where we want to give up. There's times where God will let you use your tongue to say things you ought never to have said. But in that place of, of saying it doesn't make it true. And though that you, again, been discouraged doesn't mean that God doesn't have a plan for you. Doesn't mean that God's done. Sometimes, you know, uh, when it came down to it, God could have rescued Jesus from the cross, but he waited. He waited three days. And on the third day, he resurrected him, not the way that they wanted to see him. They wanted to have him come back in the flesh and do all the things he was doing before. God has different plans. Resurrection power is amazing. In this place, again, Elijah was intimidated by Jezebel. But again, it wasn't the end. Let's go on to Matthew. Let's see what, how, how uh, oh, John the Baptist did. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, are you coming one, or do we look for another? Are you, the, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? So even John the Baptist, while he's in, in prison, knowing that Jesus and John the Baptist were cousins, and they knew the prophet. John the Baptist knew, again, about Mary being visited by an angel. That was a story that was a family story. So he kind of had an idea that, you know, Jesus was the Messiah. In the end of the day here, the enemy will try to intimidate you. And if you've not been intimidated, it won't be long before we all are going to be intimidated one way or the other. The enemy is a liar. Sometimes your need will intimidate you. Sometimes your finances or lack of finances will intimidate you. Sometimes relationships will intimidate you because you don't know what's going to happen. In our world, one thing that, again, is a constant, there's a lot of crazy people out there. You know, it, they won't say it in the media because of these gun violent things, but that's all about crazy. You know, who in their right mind kills anyone, much less go into a school and unload a gun on them? What kind of craziness is that, right? But they won't even say that out loud. How, how pathetic is that, that they won't even come out and say, that, that, that's messed up in that person, because they don't want to let that out. But if you've been around, there's a lot of crazy everywhere. And it's hard to defend against crazy. Let me just say it over here. It's hard to defend against crazy. If there's a lot of crazy out there. So what do you do? You trust God. Amen. I, I know there's a lot of people that are gun toting people. I am not one of them. I'm just to say it out loud. If you want to break in my house and beat me up and bring your gun, I, I'll know who the first suspects will be now. <laughs> but God's my defense. I mean, I, I, there's crazy, and I know it. But every demon in hell could try to stop you, but when God's for you, who can be against you? And the enemy don't know who he's playing with. Because as a child of God, you're not done until God says you're done. Amen. And the devil can't take you one more day. He, he doesn't have the right to do that. And you need to believe that with all your heart. The devil does not have the right. So stake your claim. Say, devil, you ain't coming in here. When your fear comes to grip you, you need to rebuke the devil. Because it says that when you rebuke him, the, the enemy will flee. Again, and there are kids that need to be taught that at a very young age that the devil's a liar, he's a thief. And again, there is no monster that can take you because Jesus is with you. And again, speak his name because demons will flee. We, we, we need to believe that with all of our heart. But that's not just a lie. See, the Jezebel can get you to run, but the enemy will just use someone else. Because it's not about Jezebel or that spirit. It's about the devil who has a plan to knock you out. Amen. So I, I just want to encourage you, no matter what's going on, sometimes we let things define us. Like, you know, God used Elijah knowing that he, he, would, he would run from Jezebel. He chose him. There's some people that say, well, God, you know, he messed up, so God took him out. I don't believe that. But you can, even where you're 
the one, you know, the Holy Spirit's in you too, so you can just find your interpretation of that. But for me, I'm saying the enemy will try to come and go after you. The question is, what are you going to do about it? You know, so today, as we, we're going to conclude, I, I, I just made these comparisons, again, to remind us that we're in a spiritual battle. And I, I, this has been a, a session here today. I may be teaching more than I'm preaching. I just wanted to, I want to put it out there because there are things the enemy has placed before us. And if God is with you, the enemy wants to stop you. Amen. And he'll put a Jezebel or, or an Ahab or, or somebody in your path to try to keep you from that. Do not let that which has happened in the past about you that try to define you or create some idea that that's the way it is. No, it's the way that God says it is. And anyone that would try to come against that, you can have spiritual people in high places. And unfortunately, they talk about church hurt. But, you know, the devil's a liar. And he'll use a minister as well as a deacon or a Sunday school teacher or anyone else. But God have mercy on their soul when they have to stand before God and give an account. That they who claim to be in a position of authority abused it somehow. And there's all kinds of stuff that's happening in our world. And the devil's a liar, and he's a thief. And he loves masquerading and using hypocrisy. He will use that every time he can. And I don't want to do anything, again, I fear that the fear of the Lord would guide every one of us today. I don't want to give Jesus a black eye ever. I don't want to do something that's going to abuse the name of Jesus. I want to be those three things, shh, which is an acronym. Simplicity, sincerity, humility. Let me just say that again. Jesus told his disciples, don't tell anybody. Why do, you, why do you do that? Because it's not about the PR game that the world plays or even the church plays. This is about you and Jesus. And it is in sincerity and simplicity that we find strength, that we find who we are. And until we come to that encounter, it's not all that complicated. God never called anybody to be a theologian as a believer. He's called you to be a follower first. If you feel like you want to study theology, then go for it. But don't put that on everybody else if they have to do that too. Just be a follower. And the last thing it says is this place of humility. I was reading a, a Catholic prayer that blew my mind. It was called, it's called the Litany of Humility. Read it in a more contemporary version because it says, I'm not all that. That's really what it comes down to is, God, if I'm trying to impress people, forgive me. If I'm trying to, to put myself forward over other people, forgive me. You know, this place of humility is something that's a real deal, you know, and, and I think we need to embrace that. That's why I'd rather hand out vegetables any day of the week. It's a humble task. It's not complicated. It's, and, and I can sincerely give them with no strings attached. Mm -hmm. Seriously. Mm -hmm. There are too many people trying to get others in a holy headlock, trying to get them to impress somebody else about who, how spiritual they are, quote all the things in the Bible. I quote the scripture here. But rarely will you hear me quote the scripture when I'm talking to somebody that needs the Lord. Because I am not trying to impress them with knowledge, because knowledge will never save them. Their only hope is an encounter with Jesus. And I can't provide that, only God can. And so when I say this to you today, we are a forerunner. You are a forerunner. Let me just say it clearly. God has a mission, a plan. It said that he created you to do good things beforehand. Before you were born, he created you to do some stuff. So, you're saying, who am I? You're God's child. And if you're God's child, he's got a plan and a purpose for you. Don't give up on that. You must believe it. And it says that that's the destiny which each and every one of us has. I, I don't know how God works all those things out, predestination, whatever you want to call it. I just know that's God's stuff there, and I believe it. There's things that you can do that I can't do. There's things that you can say to your friend or somebody at the right time in the right place that you can do that. That is the forerunner nature of God. That's why it says that it's not a lot just Elijah. It's not just John the Baptist. No, it's a, a spirit of Jesus operating in you and me that gives hope to people because there's a lot of hopelessness out there. And unless somebody speaks up, unless somebody steps up, unless somebody gets brave enough to point their finger into Ahab and say, this is the way it is, devil. This is the way it's going to happen. This way it's going to come down. And in that place, you got to have some spot to do that. And there are too many people like Ahab giving in to the devil. All right, we're, we're concluded. I'm, I'm way, way over time. Okay, let's, let's stand. We're going to pray. God help us make sense out of just what I just said, right? So, Father, I just come right now in the name of Jesus. I just speak life and hope. Lord, in us. We can't give what we don't have. And so, Lord, we just invite you to come in and 
and let there be hope. Let us, let us have that sense again of what you want, the Lord, for our own lives. I, I, I pray there's some that have heard these things and they've been in the wilderness. They've been in survival mode. They don't know how they're going to get through the things that are in right now. It's over their head. But they came to church today. And it's never over your head, Jesus. You put everything under your feet. And when we trust in you, Lord, it never will be over our head. Because, God, you're able to make a way where there seems to be no way. Lord, I thank you right now for every person in this room. That, Lord, you have a plan for them. A plan within a plan. And, Lord, just because their plan didn't work out, Lord, your plan is a resurrection plan. That would seem to be dead. Sometimes our vision has to die before you can convert something real, something amazing, something beyond us. And so, Father, I just pray for each one that's here today, God. Power, authority, might, and dominion. Break the spirit of domination. Lord, whether that's an authority, whether that's something that's happened in the past, Lord, it cannot have them, it cannot hold them. The enemy's a liar, and he's a thief, and he's under the feet of Jesus because on the cross he defeated the devil. That hell and the grave belong to God Almighty. And today, Lord, we thank you for the power, Lord, that breaks intimidation. There's so many times where we don't think we can. Lord, break off the intimidation before us so that we might do your will. And Lord, we just come against the, the manipulation. Lord, our culture is constantly trying to manipulate us, saying, if we want to be happy, we need this. If we want to, if we want to feel good about ourselves, we have to have this. But Lord, what we need is you. We need hope. We need faith that can move mountains. We need love that Lord transcends. And I pray, God, right now, these things that are seen, these things that are sincere, these things that, Lord, are, are humble things, Lord, help us to embrace it right now. In the name of the Lord, thank you, Jesus. I'm going to invite Pastor Myers to come. She's going to close our time in the room. So she's going to just say another prayer. I'm going to slip out to the back so I can read it for you. Father God, as we humbly but also boldly approach your throne with a heart of thanksgiving and love. Father God, we thank you for this time that we have together in the sharing of your word, Lord Jesus. We thank you for just giving us life and allowing us to be a beacon on the hill. Father God, we thank you for the love you give us. We thank you for making us in your image for the purpose of worship and praising you. Father God, just give us a heart of repentance, Lord Jesus, on this day. We plead the blood of Jesus for anyone that is ailing in physical, mental, social, financial, Lord Jesus. Just, just be like the footprints in the sand, Father God. Lift them up and carry them, Father God. Let them know that, you know, you are the ultimate Alpha and the Omega. We call our Jehovah Rapha for the healing, the mighty healing of those who are who are hearts are aching, who whose bodies are aching, whose minds are aching, Father God. Oh, we call out to the families who've lost those who've been addicted to to, to, to drugs and, and alcohol, Father God, for those who Past, Father God, just give them a mighty healing, Lord Jesus. Father God, just bless this congregation as they go to and fro, Father God, give them mercy's journey on this day. Until we meet again, we say amen. 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 So this is closed. Let's get the Facebook and those to you. You know, I agree with like the man.